Tragedy in Hope, A History of the World in Our Time, by Carol Quigley. Chapter 20 The United States and the Middle Class Crisis The character of any society is determined less by what it is actually like than by the picture it has of itself and of what it aspires to be. From this point of view, American society of the 1920s was largely middle class. Its values and aspirations were middle class, and power or influence within it was in the hands of middle class people. On the whole, this was regarded as proper, except by iconoclastic writers who gained fortune and reputation simply by satirizing or criticizing middle class customs. To be sure, even the most vigorous defenders of bourgeois America did not pretend that all Americans were middle class. Only the more important ones were. But they did see the country as organized in middle class terms, and they looked forward to a not remote future in which everyone would be middle class, except for a small, shiftless minority of no importance. To these defenders, and probably, also, to the shiftless minority, American society was regarded as a ladder of opportunity up which anyone could work his way, on rungs of increased affluence, to the supreme positions of wealth and power near the top. Wealth, power, prestige, and respect were all obtained by the same standard, based on money. This, in turn, was based on a pervasive emotional insecurity that sought relief in the ownership and control of material possessions. The basis for this may be seen more clearly in the origins of this bourgeois middle class. A thousand years ago, Europe had a two-class society in which a small upper class of nobles and upper clergy were supported by a great mass of peasants. The nobles defended this world, and the clergy opened the way to the next world, while the peasants provided the food and other material needs for the whole society. All three had security in their social relationships, in that they occupied positions of social status that satisfied their psychic needs for companionship, economic security, a foreseeable future, and purpose of their efforts. Members of both classes had little anxiety about loss of these things by any likely outcome of events, and all thus had emotional security. In the course of the medieval period, chiefly in the 12th and 13th centuries, this simple two-class society was modified by the intrusion of a small but distinctly different new class between them. Because this new class was between, we call it middle class. Just as we call it bourgeois, after burge meaning town, from the fact that it resided in towns, a new kind of social aggregate. The two older established classes were almost completely rural and intimately associated with the land, economically, socially, and spiritually. The permanence of the land and the intimate connection of the land, with the most basic of human needs, especially food, amplified the emotional security associated with the older classes. The new middle class of bourgeoisie, who grew up between the two older classes, had none of these things. They were commercial peoples, concerned with exchange of goods, mostly luxury goods, in a society where all their prospective customers already had the basic necessities of life, provided by their status. The new middle class had no status in a society based on status. They had no security or permanence in a society that placed the highest value on these qualities. They had no law, since medieval law was largely past customs and their activities were not customary ones, in a society that highly valued law. The flow of the necessities of life, notably food, 
to the new town dwellers was precarious, so that some of their earliest and most emphatic actions were taken to ensure the flow of such goods from the surrounding country to the town. All the things the bourgeois did were new things. All were precarious and insecure, and their whole lives were lived without the status, permanence, and security the society of the day most highly valued. The risks and rewards of commercial enterprise, well reflected in the fluctuating fortunes of figures such as Antonio and the Merchant of Venice, were extreme. A single venture could ruin a merchant or make him rich. This insecurity was increased by the fact that the prevalent religion of the day disapproved of what he was doing, seeking profits or taking interest, and could see no way of providing religious service to town dwellers because of the intimate association of the ecclesiastical system with the existing arrangement of rural land holding. For these and other reasons, psychic insecurity became the keynote of the new middle-class outlook. It still is. The only remedy for this insecurity of the middle class seemed to it to be the accumulation of more possessions that could be a demonstration to the world of the individual's importance and power. In this way, for the middle class, the general goal of medieval man to seek future salvation in the hereafter was secularized to an effort to seek future security in this world by acquisition of wealth and its accompanying power and social prestige. But the social prestige from wealth was most available among fellow bourgeoisie, rather than among nobles or peasants. Thus the opinions of one's fellow bourgeoisie, by wealth and by conformity to bourgeois values, became the motivating drives of the middle classes, creating what has been called the acquisitive society. In that society, prudence, discretion, conformity, moderation, except in acquisition, decorum, frugality, became the marks of a sound man. Credit became more important than intrinsic personal qualities, and credit was based on the appearances of things, especially the appearances of the external material accessories of life. The facts of a man's personal qualities, such as kindness, affection, thoughtfulness, generosity, personal insight, and such, were increasingly irrelevant or even adverse to the middle-class evaluation of a man. Instead, the middle-class evaluation rested rather on non-personal attributes and on external accessories. Where personal qualities were admired, they were those that contributed to acquisition, often qualities opposed to the established values of the Christian outlook, such as love, charity, generosity, gentleness, or unselfishness. These middle-class qualities included decisiveness, selfishness, impersonality, ruthless energy, and insatiable ambition. As the middle classes and their commercialization of all human relationships spread through Western society in the centuries from the 12th to the 20th, they largely modified and, to some extent, reversed the values of Western society earlier. In some cases, the old values, such as future preference or self-discipline, remained, but were redirected. Future preference ceased to be transcendental in its aim, and became secularized. Self-discipline ceased to seek spirituality by restraining sensuality, and instead sought material acquisition. In general, the new middle-class outlook had a considerable religious basis, but it was the religion of the medieval heresies and of Puritanism rather than the religion of Roman Christianity. This complex outlook that we call middle class or bourgeois is, of course, the chief basis of our world today. Western society 
is the richest and most powerful society that has ever existed, largely because it has been impelled forward along these lines, beyond the rational degree necessary to satisfy human needs, by the irrational drive for achievement in terms of material ambitions. To be sure, Western society always had other kinds of people, and the majority of the people in Western society probably had other outlooks and values. But it was middle-class urgency that pushed modern developments in the direction they took. There were always in our society dreamers and truth-seekers and tinkerers. They, as poets, scientists, and engineers, thought up innovations which the middle classes adopted and exploited if they seemed likely to be profit-producing. Middle-class self-discipline and future preference provided the savings and investment without which any innovation, no matter how appealing in theory, would be set aside and neglected. But the innovation that could attract middle-class approval and exploitation were the ones that made our world today so different from the world of our grandparents and ancestors. The middle-class character was imposed most strongly on the United States. In order to identify it and to discuss a very complex pattern of outlooks and values, we shall try to summarize it. At its basis is psychic insecurity founded on lack of secure social status. The cure for such insecurity became insatiable material acquisition. From this flowed a large number of attributes, of which we shall list only five. Future preference, self-discipline, social conformity, infinitely expandable material demand, and a general emphasis on externalized, impersonal values. Those who have this outlook are middle class. Those who lack it are something else. Thus, middle-class status is a matter of outlook and not a matter of occupation or status. There can be middle-class clergy or teachers or scientists. Indeed, in the United States, most of these three groups are middle-class, although their theoretical devotion to truth rather than to profit or to others rather than to self might seem to imply that they should not be middle class. And indeed, they should not be, for the urge to seek truth or to help others are not really compatible with the middle class values. But in our culture, the latter have been so influential and pervasive, and the economic power of middle class leaders has been so great, that many people whose occupations, on the face of it, should make them other than middle class, nonetheless have adopted major parts of the middle class outlook and seek material success in religion or teaching or science. The middle class outlook, born in the Netherlands and northern Italy and other places in the medieval period, has been passed on by being inculcated to children as the proper attitude for them to emulate. It could pass on from generation to generation and from century to century, as long as parents continued to believe it themselves and disciplined their children to accept it. The minority of children who did not accept it were disowned and fell out of the middle classes. What is even more important, they were, until recently, pitied and rejected by their families. In this way, those who accepted the outlook marched on in the steadily swelling ranks of the triumphant middle classes until the 20th century. For more than half a century from before World War I, the middle class outlook has been under relentless attack, often by its most ardent members, who heedlessly and unknowingly have undermined and destroyed many of the basic social customs that preserved it through earlier generations. Many of these changes occurred from changes in child-rearing practices, and many arose from the very success of the middle-class way of life, which achieved material affluence that tended to weaken the older emphasis on self-discipline, saving, future preference, and the rest of it. <laughs>
One of the chief changes, fundamental to the survival of the middle-class outlook, was a change in our society's basic conception of human nature. This had two parts to it. The traditional Christian attitude toward human personality was that human nature was essentially good, and that it was formed and modified by social pressures and training. The goodness of human nature was based on the belief that it was a kind of weaker copy of God's nature, lacking many of God's qualities in degree rather than in kind, but nonetheless perfectible and perfectible largely by its own efforts, with God's guidance. The Christian view of the universe as a hierarchy of beings, with man about two-thirds of the way up, saw these beings, especially man, as fundamentally free creatures, able to move at their own volition toward God or away from Him, and guided or attracted in the correct direction from realization of their potentialities by God's presence at the top of the universe, a presence which, like the North Magnetic Pole, attracted men as compasses upward toward full realization and knowledge of God, who was the fulfillment of all good. Thus the effort came from free men, the guidance came from God's grace, and ultimately the motive power came from God's attractiveness. In this Western point of view, evil and sin were negative qualities. They arose from the absence of good, not from the presence of evil. Thus sin was the failure to do the right thing, not doing the wrong thing, except indirectly and secondarily. In this view, the devil, Lucifer, was not the epitome of positive wickedness, but was one of the highest of the angels, close to God in his rational nature, who fell because he failed to keep his perspective and believed that he was as good as God. In this Christian outlook, the chief task was to train men so that they would use their intrinsic freedom to do the right thing by following God's guidance. Opposed to this Western view of the world and the nature of men, there was, from the beginning, another opposed view of both, which received its most explicit formulation by the Persian Zoroaster in the 7th century BC, and came into the Western tradition as a minor, heretical theme. It came in through the Persian influence on the Hebrews, especially during the Babylonian captivity of the Jews in the 6th century BC, and it came in more fully through the Greek rationalists' tradition from Pythagoras to Plato. This latter tradition encircled the early Christian religion, giving rise to many of the controversies that were settled in the early church councils and continuing on in the many heresies that extended through history from the Arians, the Manichaeans, Luther, Calvin, and the Jansenists. The chief avenue by which these ideas, which were constantly rejected by the endless discussions formulating the doctrine of the West, continued to survive was through the influence of St. Augustine. From this dissident minority point of view came 17th century Puritanism. The general distinction of this point of view from Zoroaster to William Golding in Lord of the Flies is that the world and the flesh are positive evils, and that man, in at least this physical part of his nature, is essentially evil. As a consequence, he must be disciplined totally to prevent him from destroying himself and the world. In this view, the devil is a force, or being, of positive malevolence, and man by himself is incapable of any good and is accordingly not free. He can be saved in eternity by God's grace alone, and he can get through this temporal world only by being subjected to a regime of total despotism. The direction and nature of the despotism is not regarded as important, since the really important thing 
is that man's innate destructiveness be controlled. Nothing could be more sharply contrasted than these two points of view, the orthodox and the puritanical. The contrasts can be summed up thus. Orthodox, evil is absence of good. Man is basically good. Man is free. Man can contribute to his salvation by good works. Self-discipline is necessary to guide or direct. Truth is found from experience and revelation, interpreted by tradition. Puritan. Evil is positive entity. Man is basically evil. Man is a slave of his nature. Man can be saved only by God. Discipline must be external and total. Truth is found by rational deduction from revelation. The Puritan point of view, which had been struggling to take over Western civilization for its first thousand years or more, almost did so in the 17th century. It was represented to varying degrees in the work and agitations of Luther, Calvin, Thomas Hobbes, Cornelius Jansen, Augustinus, 1640, Antoine Arnold, 1612-1694, Balise Pascal, and others. In general, this point of view believed that the truth was to be found by rational deduction from a few basic revealed truths in the way that Euclid's geometry and Descartes' analytical geometry were based on rational deduction from a few self-evident axioms. The result was a largely deterministic human situation, in sharp contrast with the orthodox point of view, still represented in the Anglican and Roman churches, which saw man as largely free in a universe whose rules were to be found most readily by tradition and the general consensus. The Puritan point of view tended to support political despotism and to seek a one-class uniform society, while the older view put much greater emphasis on traditional pluralism and saw society as a unit of diversities. The newer idea led directly to mercantilism, which regarded political economic life as a struggle to the death in a world where there was no sufficient wealth or space for different groups. To them, wealth was limited to a fixed amount in the world as a whole, and one man's gain was someone else's loss. That meant that the basic struggles of this world were irreconcilable and must be fought to a finish. This was part of the Puritan belief that nature was evil and that a state of nature was a jungle of violent conflicts. Some of these ideas changed, others were retained, and a few were rearranged and modified in the following periods of the Enlightenment, the Romantic Movement, and Scientific Materialism. All three of these returned to the older idea that man and nature were essentially good, and to this restored belief in the Garden of Eden they joined a basically optimistic belief in man's ability to deal with his problems and to guide his own destiny. Society and its conventions came to be regarded as evil, and the guidance of tradition was generally rejected by the late Enlightenment and the early Romantics, although the excesses of the French Revolution drove many of the latter Romantics back to rely on history and traditions because of their growing feeling of the inadequacy of human reason. One large change in all three periods was the community of interests, which rejected mercantilism's insistence on limited wealth and the basic incompatibility of interests for the more optimistic belief that all parties could somehow adjust their interests within a community in which all would benefit mutually. The application of Darwinism to human society changed this idea again, toward the end of the 19th century, and provided the ideological justification for the wars of extermination of Nazism and Fascism 
Only after the middle of the 20th century did a gradual reappearance of the old Christian ideas of love and charity modify this view, replacing it with the older idea that diverse human interests are basically reconcilable. All this shifting of ideas, many of them unstated or even unconscious assumptions, and the gradual growth of affluence helped to destroy middle-class motivations and values. American society had been largely, but not entirely, middle-class. Above the middle-class, which dominated the country in the first half of the 20th century, were a small group of aristocrats. Below were the petty bourgeoisie, who had middle-class aspirations but were generally more insecure and often bitter because they did not obtain middle-class rewards. Below these two middle classes were two lower classes, the workers and the lumpen proletariat, or socially disorganized, who had very little in common with each other. Outside this heretical structure of five groups in three classes, aristocrat, middle, and lower, were two other groupings that were not really part of the hierarchical structure. On the left were the intellectuals, and on the right were the religious. These held in common the idea that the truth, to them, was more important than interests. But they differed greatly from the fact that the religious believed that they knew what the truth was, while the intellectuals were still seeking it. This whole arrangement was much more like a planetary arrangement of social economic groupings than it was like the middle class vision of society as a ladder of opportunity. The ladder really included only the middle classes, with the workers below. The planetary view, becoming increasingly widespread, saw the middle classes in the center with the other five surrounding these. Social movement was possible in circular as well as in vertical directions, as the older ladder view of society believed, so that sons of workers could rise into the middle classes or move right into the religious, left into the intelligentsia, or even fall downward into the declassed dregs. So too, in theory, the children, or more likely the grandchildren, of the upper middle class could move upward into aristocracy, which could also be approached from the intellectuals or the religious. Strangely enough, the non-middle classes had more characteristics in common with each other than they did with the middle classes in their midst. The chief reason for this was that all other groups had value systems different from the middle classes, and above all, placed no emphasis on display of material affluence as proof of social status. From this came a number of somewhat similar qualities and attitudes that often gave the non-middle class groups more in common and easier social intercourse than any of them had with the middle classes. For example, all placed much more emphasis on real personal qualities and much less on such things as clothing residence, academic background, or kind of transportation used, all of which were important in determining middle-class reactions to people. In a sense, all were more sincere, personally more secure, not the lumpen proletariat, and less hypocritical than the middle class, and accordingly were much more inclined to judge any new acquaintance on his merits. Moreover, the middle classes, in order to provide their children with middle class advantages, had few children, while the other groups placed little restriction on family size, except for some intellectuals. Thus aristocrats, religious, workers, the declassed, and many intellectuals had large families, while only the uppermost and most securely established middle class families as part of the transition to aristocracy, had larger families. Ideas of morality also tended to set the middle classes off from 
most of the others. The latter tended to regard morality in terms of honesty and integrity of character, while the middle classes based it on actions, especially sexual actions. Even the religious based sin, to some extent, on purpose, attitude, and mental context of the act rather than on the act itself, and did not restrict morality as narrowly to sexual behavior as did the middle classes. However, the middle class influence has been so pervasive in the modern world that many of the other groups fell under its influence to the extent that the word morality, by the early 20th century, came to mean sex. The Jansenist influence in American Roman Catholicism, for example, is so strong that sins concerning sex are widely regarded by Catholics as the worst of sins, in spite of the fact that Catholic doctrine continues to regard pride as the worst sin and sexual sins as much less important as Dante did. At any rate, sex was generally regarded with greater indulgence by aristocrats, workers, intellectuals, or the declassed than by the middle classes, or the more puritanical religious. In America, as elsewhere, aristocracy represents money and position grown old, and is organized in terms of families rather than of individuals. Traditionally, it was made up of those whose families had had money, position, and social prestige for so long that they never had to think about these and, above all, never had to impress any other person with the fact that they had them. They accepted these attributes of family membership as a right and an obligation. Since they had no idea that these could be lost, they had a basic psychological security, similar to that of the religious and workers. Thus, like these other two, they were self-assured, natural, but distant. Their manners were gracious but impersonal. Their chief characteristic was the assumption that their family position had obligations. This noblesse oblige led them to participate in school sports, even if they lacked obvious talent, to serve their university, usually a family tradition, in any helpful way, such as fundraising, to serve their church in a similar way, and to offer their services to their local community, their state, and their country as an obligation. They often scandalized their middle-class acquaintances by their unconventionality and social informality, greeting workers, recent immigrants, or even outcasts by their given names arriving at evening meetings in tweeds, or traveling in cheap, small cars to formal weddings. The kind of a car a person drove was, until very recently, one of the best guides to middle-class status, since a car to the middle classes was a status symbol, while to the other classes it was a means of getting somewhere. Oversized Oldsmobiles, Cadillacs and Lincoln Continentals are still middle-class cars, but in recent years, with the weakening of the middle-class outlook, almost anyone might be found driving a Volkswagen. Another good evidence of class may be seen in the treatment given to servants, or those who work in one's home. The lower classes treat these as equals, the middle classes treat them as inferiors, while aristocrats treat them as equals or even superiors. On the whole, the number of aristocratic families in the United States is very few, with a couple in each of the older states, especially New England, and in the older areas of the South, such as Charleston or Natchez, Mississippi with the chief concentrations in the small towns around Boston and on the Hudson River Valley. Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt would be one example. A somewhat larger group of semi-aristocrats 
consists of those like the Lodges, Rockefellers, or Kennedys, who are not yet completely aristocratic, either because they are not, in generations, far enough removed from money-making, or because of the persistence of a commercial or business tradition in the family. But these are aristocrats in the sense that they have accepted a family obligation of service to the community. The significance of this aristocratic tradition may be seen in Massachusetts politics. There, two decades ago, the governorship of both senatorial seats were held by a Bradford, a Seltonstall, and a Lodge, while in 1964, two of these positions were held by Endicott Peabody and Leverett Saltonstall. The working class in the United States is much smaller than we might assume, since most American workers are seeking to rise socially, to help their children to rise socially, and are considerably concerned with status symbols. Such people, even if laborers, are not working class, but are rather petty bourgeoisie. The real working class are rather relaxed, have present rather than future preference, generally worry very little about their status in the eyes of the world, enjoy their ordinary lives, including food, sex, and leisure, and have little desire to change their jobs or positions. They are generally relaxed, have a taste for broad humor, are natural, direct, and friendly, without large basic insecurities of personality. The world depression, by destroying their jobs and economic security, much reduced this group, which was always proportionally smaller in America, the land of aspiration for everyone, than in Europe. The second most numerous group in the United States is the petty bourgeoisie, including millions of persons who regard themselves as middle class and are under all the middle class anxieties and pressures, but often earn less money than unionized laborers. As a result of these things, they are often very insecure, envious, filled with hatreds, and are generally the chief recruits for any radical right. Fascist or hate campaigns against any group that is different or which refuses to conform to middle-class values. Made up of clerks, shopkeepers, and vast numbers of office workers in business, government, finance, and education, they tend to regard their white-collar status as the chief value in life, and live in an atmosphere of envy, pettiness, insecurity, and frustration. They form the major portion of the Republican Party's supporters, in the towns of America, as they did for the Nazis in Germany thirty years ago. In general, the political alignments in the United States have been influenced even more by these class and psychological considerations than they have been by income, economic, or occupational considerations. The Republican Party has been the party of the middle classes, and the Democratic Party has been the party of the rest. In general, aristocrats have tended to move toward the Democrats, while semi-aristocrats often remain Republican, with their middle-class parents or grandparents. Except where historical circumstance, chiefly in New England, the Middle West, and the South, where Civil War memories remained green, operated. This meant that the Republican Party, whose 19th century superiority had been based on the division of farmers into South and West over the slave issue, became an established majority party in the 20th century, but became once again a minority party because of the disintegration of their middle class support following 1945. Even in the period of middle class dominance, the Republicans had lost control of the federal government because of the narrowly plutocratic control of the party that split it in 1912 and alienated most of the rest of the country in 1932. Twenty years later, in 1952, the country looked solidly middle class, but in fact, by that date, 
middle-class morale was almost totally destroyed. The middle classes themselves were in disintegration, and the majority of Americans were becoming less middle class in outlook. This change is one of the most significant transformations of the 20th century. The future of the United States, of Western civilization, and of the world depends on what kind of outlook replaces the dissolving middle class ideology in the next generation. The weakening of this middle class ideology was a chief cause of the panic of the middle classes, and especially of the petty bourgeoisie in the Eisenhower era. The general himself was repelled by the radical right, whose impetus had been a chief element, but far from the most important element in his election, although the lower middle class groups had preferred Senator Taft as their leader. Eisenhower, however, had been preferred by the Eastern establishment of old Wall Street, Ivy League, semi-aristocratic Anglophiles, whose real strength rested in their control of Eastern financial endowments, operating from foundations, academic halls, and other tax-exempt refuges. As we have said, this Eastern establishment was really above parties and was much more concerned with policies than with party victories. They had been the dominant element in both parties since 1900 and practiced the political techniques of William C. Whitney and J. P. Morgan. They were, as we have said, Anglophile, cosmopolitan, Ivy League, internationalist, astonishingly liberal, patrons of the arts, and relatively humanitarian. All these things made them an anthema to the lower middle class and petty bourgeois groups, chiefly in small towns and in the Middle West, who supplied the votes in Republican electoral victories, but found it so difficult to control nominations, especially in presidential elections, because the big money necessary for nominating in a Republican National Convention was allied to Wall Street and to the Eastern Establishment. The ability of the latter to nominate Eisenhower over Taft in 1952 was a bitter pill to the radical bourgeoisie and was not coated sufficiently by the naming of Nixon, a man much closer to their hearts, for the vice presidential post. The split between these two wings of the Republican Party and Eisenhower's preferences for the upper bourgeois rather than for the petty bourgeois wing paralyzed both of his administrations and was the significant element in Kennedy's narrow victory over Nixon in 1960 and in Johnson's much more decisive victory over Goldwater in 1964. Kennedy, despite his Irish Catholicism, was an establishment figure. This did not arise from his semi-aristocratic attitudes or his Harvard connections, which were always tenuous since Irish Catholicism is not yet completely acceptable at Harvard. These helped, but John Kennedy's introduction to the establishment arose from his support of Britain, in opposition to his father, in the critical days of the American Embassy in London in 1938 to 1940. His acceptance into the English establishment opened its American branch as well. The former was indicated by a number of events, such as Sister Kathleen's marriage to the Marquis of Harrington, and the shifting of Caroline's nursery school from the White House to the British Embassy after her father's assassination. The ambassador, Ormsby Gore, 5th Baron Harlech, was the son of an old associate of Lord Milner and Leo Amory, when they were the active core of the British-American Atlantic establishment. Another indication of this connection was the large number of Oxford-trained men appointed to office by President Kennedy. The period since 1950 has seen the beginnings of a revolutionary change in American politics. This change is not so closely related to the changes in American economic life, 
as it is to the transformation in social life. But without the changes in economic life, the social influences could not have operated. What has been happening has been a disintegration of the middle class and a corresponding increase in significance by the petty bourgeoisie at the same time that the economic influence of the older Wall Street financial groups has been weakening and been challenged by new wealth springing up outside the eastern cities, notably in the southwest and far west. These new sources of wealth have been based very largely on government action and government spending, but have not, nonetheless, adopted a petty bourgeois outlook rather than the semi-aristocratic outlook that pervades the Eastern establishment. This new wealth, based on petroleum, natural gas, ruthless exploitation of national resources, the aviation industry, military bases in the South and West, and finally on space with all its attendant activities, has centered in Texas and Southern California. Its existence for the first time made it possible for the petty bourgeois outlook to make itself felt in the political nomination process instead of the unrewarding effort to influence politics by voting for a Republican candidate nominated under Eastern establishment influence. In these terms, the political struggle in the United States has shifted in two ways, or even three. This struggle in the minds of the ill-informed had always been viewed as a struggle between Republicans and Democrats at the ballot box in November. Wall Street, long ago, however, had seen that the real struggle was in the nominating conventions the preceding summer. This realization was forced upon the petty bourgeois supporters of Republican candidates by their antipathy for Willicke, Dewey, Eisenhower, and other Wall Street interventionists, and their ability to nominate their congressional favorites, like Senators Noland, Bricker, and Taft, at National Party conventions. Just as these disgruntled voters reached this conclusion, with Taft's failure in 1952, the new wealth appeared in the political picture, sharing the petty bourgeoisie's suspicions of the East, big cities, Ivy League universities, foreigners, intellectuals, workers, and aristocrats. By the 1964 election, the major political issue in the country was the financial struggle behind the scenes between the old wealth, civilized and cultured in foundations, and the new wealth, virile and uninformed, arising from the flowing profits of government-dependent corporations in the Southwest and West. At issue here was the whole future face of America, for the older wealth stood for values and aims close to the Western traditions of diversity, tolerance, human rights and values, freedoms, and the rest of it, while the newer wealth stood for the narrow and fear-wracked aims of petty bourgeois insecurity and egocentricity. The nominal issues between them, such as that between internationalism and unilateral isolationism, which its supporters preferred to rename nationalism, were less fundamental than they seemed for the real issue was the control of the federal government's tremendous power to influence the future of America by spending of government funds. The petty bourgeois and new wealth groups wanted to continue that spending into the industrial military complex, such as defense and space, while the older wealth and non-bourgeois groups wanted to direct it towards social diversity and social amelioration for the aged and the young, for education, for social outcasts, and for protecting national resources for future use. The outcome of this struggle, which still goes on, is one in which civilized people can afford to be optimistic. For the newer wealth is unbelievably ignorant and misinformed. In their growing concern to control political nominations, they ignored the even greater need to win elections.
they did not realize that the disintegration of the middle classes, chiefly from the abandonment of the middle class outlook, was creating an American electorate that would never elect any candidate the newer wealth would care to nominate. As part of this lack of vision, the new wealth and its petty bourgeois supporters ignored the well-established principle that a national candidate must have a national appeal, and that this is obtained best by a candidate close to the center. In American politics, we have several parties included under the blanket words Democratic and Republican. In oversimplified terms, as I have said, the Republicans were the party of the middle classes, and the Democrats were the party of the fringes. Both of these were subdivided, each with a congressional and a national party wing. The Republican Congressional Party, representing localism, was much farther to the right than the National Republican Party, and as such was closer to the petty bourgeois than to the upper middle class outlook. The Democratic Congressional Party was much more clearly of the fringes of minorities, and thus often further to the left than the Democratic National Party. The party machinery in each case was in congressional party control during the intervals between the quadrennial presidential elections. But, in order to win these elections, each had to call into existence, in presidential election years, its shadowy national party. This meant that the Republicans had to appear to move to the left, closer to the center, while the Democrats had also to move from the fringes toward the center, usually by moving to the right. As a result, the national parties and their presidential candidates, with the Eastern establishment assiduously fostering the process behind the scenes, moved closer together and nearly met in the center with almost identical candidates and platforms, although the process was concealed as much as possible by the revival of obsolescent or meaningless war cries and slogans, often going back to the Civil War. As soon as the presidential election was over, the two national parties vanished, and party controls fell back into the hands of the congressional parties, leaving the newly elected president in a precarious position between the two congressional parties, neither of which was very close to the brief national coalition that had elected him. The chief problem of American political life for a long time has been how to make the two congressional parties more national and international. The argument that the two parties should represent opposed ideals and policies, one perhaps of the right and the other of the left, is a foolish idea acceptable only to doctrinaire and academic thinkers. Instead, the two parties should be almost identical, so that the American people can throw the rascals out at any election without leading to any profound or extensive shifts in policy. The policies that are vital and necessary for America are no longer subjects of significant disagreement but are disputable only in details of procedure, priority, or method. We must remain strong, continue to function as a great world power in cooperation with other powers, avoid high-level war, keep the economy moving without significant slump, help other countries do the same, provide the basic social necessities for all our citizens, open up opportunities for social shifts for those willing to work to achieve them, and defend the basic Western outlook of diversity, pluralism, cooperation, and the rest of it, as already described. These things any national American party hoping to win a presidential election must accept, but either party in office becomes, in time, corrupt, tired, unenterprising, and vigorless. Then it should be possible to replace it, every four years if necessary, by the other party, which will be none of these things, but will still pursue, with new vigor, approximately the same basic policies. The capture of the Republican National Party 
by the extremist elements of the Republican Congressional Party in 1964 and their effort to elect Barry Goldwater to the presidency with the petty bourgeois extremist alone was only a temporary aberration on the American political scene and arose from the fact that President Johnson had preempted all the issues which are, as we have said, now acceptable to the overwhelming majority and had occupied the whole broad center of the American political spectrum so that it was hardly worthwhile for the Republicans to run a real contestant against him in the same area. Thus, Goldwater was able to take control of the Republican National Party by default. The virulence behind the Goldwater campaign, however, had nothing to do with default or lack of intensity. Quite the contrary. His most ardent supporters were the extremist, petty bourgeois mentality driven to near hysteria by the disintegration of the middle classes and the steady rise in prominence of everything they considered an anthema. Catholics, Negroes, immigrants, intellectuals, aristocrats, and near-aristocrats, scientists, and educated men generally, people from big cities or from the East, cosmopolitans and internationalists, and, above all, liberals, who accept diversity as a virtue. This disintegration of the middle classes had a variety of causes, some of them intrinsic, many of them accidental, a few of them obvious, but many of them going deeply into the very depths of social existence. All these causes acted to destroy the middle classes by acting to destroy the middle class outlook. And this outlook was destroyed not by adult middle class persons abandoning it, but by a failure or inability of parents to pass it on to their children. Moreover, this failure was largely restricted to the middle class itself and not to the petty bourgeoisie, lower middle class, which, if anything, was clinging to its particular version of the middle class outlook more tenaciously and was passing it on to its offspring in an even more intensified form. What I'm saying here is that the disintegration of the middle class arose from a failure to transfer its outlook to its children. This failure was thus a failure of education and may seem, at first glance, to be all the more surprising since our education system has been, consciously or unconsciously, organized as a mechanism for indoctrination of the young in middle-class ideology. In fact, rather surprisingly, it would appear that our educational system, unlike those of continental Europe, has been more concerned with indoctrination of middle-class outlook than with teaching patriotism or nationalism. As a reflection of this, it has been more concerned with instilling attitudes and behavior than with intellectual training. In view of the fact that the American ideals of the 1920s were as much middle class as patriotic, with the so-called American way of life, identified rather with the American economic and social system than with the American political system, and the fact that a majority of school children were not from middle class families, it is not surprising that the educational system was devoted to training in the middle class outlook. Children of racial, religious, national, and class minorities all passed through the same system and received the middle class formative process with, it must be recognized, incomplete success in many cases. This refers to the public schools, but the Roman Catholic school system, especially on its upper levels, was doing the same things. The large number of Catholic men's colleges in the country, especially those operated by the Jesuits, had as their basic, if often unrecognized, aim the desire to transform the sons of working class and often of immigrant origins into middle-class people in professional occupations, chiefly law, medicine, business, and teaching. On the whole, this system was, 
until recently, a success, but is now becoming less and less successful in turning out middle-class people, especially from its upper educational levels. This failure can be attributed rather to the context within which the educational system has operated than to a failure of the system itself. As we shall see in a moment, this failure occurred chiefly within the middle-class family, a not unexpected situation, since outlook is still determined rather by reaction to family conditions than by submission to a formal educational process. Much of the disintegration of the middle-class outlook can be traced to a weakening of its chief aspects, such as future preference, intense self-discipline, and to a lesser degree, to a decreasing emphasis on infinitely expandable material demand and on the importance of middle-class status symbols. Only a few of the factors that have influenced these changes can be mentioned here.